think we think national team members, um, Olympians, Paralympians, are are probably the the area that can use us the most, especially at the start here. They're so severely underfunded and such incredible athletes with so much marketing potential. Um, and it's just they're just underutilized. Um, but Olympians are so incredible because they are very literally pouring themselves into their into their sport without a contract to guarantee anything. But they have the recognition because everybody who knows them knows who they are, knows how hard they work, and there's there's sort of this um, real affinity between them and their followers and their and their fans. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, especially here in Canada, they just don't get make enough money, and there's so many brands that can use them to help themselves grow as well. So sort of our our dream is that. Um, you know, helping athletes turn their sport into their career, especially those that, you know, their contract doesn't do enough. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to my social life. This is the podcast where you can hear the life stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. As always, today's podcast is powered by True Fan. And before we get into today's conversation with Nate Bahar, there's a couple things that we need to go over first. If you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to leave us a positive rating and review. Share this episode with a friend and subscribe to the show. Put up brand new interviews every single Monday and a brand new takeaways episode is an audio exclusive where I sit down and break down the most recent podcast episode of the week every single day. Thursday. And now, today on the podcast, we are joined by Nate Bahar. Nate is the CEO and founder of Firework, which is a new marketing platform that allows brands and athletes to form dream partnerships. And on top of that, Nate is also a professional athlete playing wide receiver for the Ottawa Red Blacks in the Canadian Football League. I used to work with Nate back when I worked for the Red Blacks, so this podcast has been a long time coming. I could not be more excited to have Nate here on the show today. Nate, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Jacob. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to get going. I'm excited to have you here, man. And where I want to start today, where I like to start every podcast, I like to go back all the way to the beginning. So talk to me about growing up in London. Um, yeah, London, Ontario is London, Ontario is London, Ontario. Um, you know, anybody that's been there knows it. Um, it's been been pretty much the same place for forever. Um, you know, it's a middle size on southwestern Ontario spot, um, not too unlike many other, you know, four or 500,000 people, cities, um, good sports town. That's for sure. You know, there's always, that's, that's one of the best parts of it for sure is, um, you know, we've always had good athletes. Like you look across even the CFL, NHL, um, whatever sport you're looking at, there's always going to be some London names on there, which is great. Um, good junior football what I, that I played in and, and some good schools. Well, I went to a really good high school. Um, I remember we always used to brag and I think grade 10 or 11, we were ranked, ranked the number one, educational public school in Canada in terms of, you know, highest education levels and all that, all that jazz. So, you know, London's London. Um, it gets overwhelmed every single year in, in September um, by Western and Fanshawe students running amok and burning it down. And then in the uh, summertime when it's just us locals there, or when it was just us locals, I should say, um, you know, you kind of got to actually enjoy the people you were around. So London's London. Um, and I probably won't be back there full time ever again. But, you know, there's the positives that came from it for sure. And London, correct me if I'm wrong, but London, I think I heard this in a podcast, is a pretty privileged place, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a, it skews pretty high income. Um, you know, we grew up in, in White Oak area, which is in sort of Pond Mills area, which would be on the other side of that spectrum. Um, but it's very, yeah, it's pretty white Anglo Saxon, Protestant, uh, wealthy, middle class, upper middle class uh, sort of place. So correct me if I'm wrong here, but this, I think this, I wrote this as a quote down from a podcast and this one says, I, I was darker than the vast majority of my city. So I'm curious as like, how does that impact you growing up as a little kid? I know there was that terrible event. I think it happened when you were nine years old. So like, I'm just curious, like what, how does that impact you growing up as a little kid like that? Um, yeah, absolutely. So for anybody, which I would imagine is everybody who doesn't know anything about me, my, you know, I was, I was raised by, by my mother in London, my dad, um, who's Jamaican. Um, spent his spent his majority of my life in tr in Toronto. Um, so I kind of go back and forth once in a while. But um, you know, my dad did teach me very young, kind of what being you know black was and what that was going to mean um, amongst people because you don't always know as a kid, especially when you're you're sort of raised um, in a bit of a bubble in that in that way. Um, you're not really sure how it's going to impact you because most kids, you know, especially in in I would not I shouldn't say especially. I think most kids to a certain age. They're not really hit with the impression, you know, the 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 um, stereotypes and everything they kind of you learn as you get older. So you're kind of just in this like bubble of everything's fine, and then you know you kind of get rudely awoken um, as you as you grow up. Um, as you know, 
somebody who looks different than the, than the vast majority of people around you. And, you know, that happened a lot in London. Um, I was kind of always aware that I was different. And I mean, sometimes, you know, that came out in the stereotypical good ways where you get picked first for handball and, you know, you get treated a little special because you're the, you know, you're the cool, the cool black kid who pull off a pair of Tim's and whatnot. Um, you know, so I won't go, I won't go saying that it's all, you know, from the moment you're born getting, getting, you know, thrown rocks at or anything like that. But, um, it definitely is just a othering experience in London. Um, and that hasn't changed one bit. And you said your dad tried to make it like very clear to you when you were a kid, like what that means, right? He definitely, you know, that's his, that's his role, right? He grew up in South Florida. Um, born in Jamaica, grew up in South Florida, moved to Toronto and spent a little bit of time in London. So he was very aware of sort of all the ugly ways that things are going to turn their head, rear their head at you. Um, and with that, I think that's just sort of, that's sort of the role of any father, you know, is especially a black father is understanding the black bodies that are, are, you know, historically, um, you know, at risk, whatever, and however that's going to show up, right? There's just so many ways of it manifesting. And that's sort of what he always tried to get across to me was that, you know, you're just not, you don't get to do the same things and have the same reactions to things and, and expect the same outcomes. So it's just not going to happen. And so jumping, and again, you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to, but jumping forward now to today, when, if and when you ever have kids, like, are you going to like kind of model how you talk to them about it the same way your dad did? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's so many, especially nowadays, there's so many examples and, and ways to speak to it and things to pull out. I mean, especially in the social media age where there's almost a, you know, a museum of posts and tweets of what happens, you know, in, in these, in different situations that I think it, it makes the conversation more necessary or easier, but more necessary because they're going to be exposed to it earlier. You know, you have to sort of be there to, to catch it. I mean, I think that's the same for anything, whether it's the sex talk you have with your kids, you probably start having that earlier because they're going to stumble their way into it, whatever, you know, a whole lot earlier than they would have in the past because it's no longer not the nudie magazines at the top of the convenience store rack. Now it's just every other, you know, targeted ad. So um, it's, much the same that way. And I mean, yeah, there's a lot of things that my dad taught me early that I would, you know, I'll bring, bring to my, my children. Um, that's just life. And your dad also taught you football, if I'm not mistaken, right? Like he's the reason you started playing. Um, yeah, for the most part, I mean, again, he grew up in South Florida, so it was always pretty near and dear to his heart. Um, uh, my mom, I think and him talked and it was the best way to get rid of my energy when I was about seven years old. So they just threw me into it head first and here we are. Well, from my understanding, it wasn't quite seven. You were a little bit younger, right? You were six wearing those black and silver jerseys back in the day. Yes. Yes, I was. Yes. Uh, London Westminster. I don't even think we had a nickname. Just Westminster LMFA team, silver and black. Um, I was six. The so minimum age was seven. And they just, I think they just snuck me in because my mom might have knew somebody. Uh, and they just let me run around like a bobblehead. <laughs> It does so bring me back to your driveway. You're about 11 or 12 years old playing basketball with your dad. And I believe you blocked him. And in that moment, he like made you pick basketball or football, right? Yeah. So I was finally, I think, getting to the point. I don't know if puberty was in full swing yet, but my athleticism was at least coming, coming to life. Um, and that's just that. I think we were playing one-on-one basketball in Toronto. Um, and yeah, I kind of took him to the, you know, I think I stole the ball or blocked him and took him to the hoop. And I think he kind of realized like, oh, shit, this kid's, uh, this kid's actually got a little something. Um, and he just made me decide. He was like, look, are you a pro, pro football player or a pro basketball player? Because um, at the time, like the local prep, the local rep teams for basketball were, you know, kind of figured, wanted to know what I was doing this summer just as well as football was. And he was like, you better decide now. Just do it. Um, and then I was like, okay, let's football. So he threw the ball away and was like, hey, go get your cleats in the trunk. And I did. And then he ran me to I puked on the football field. Um, but the, the decision was made then. It was kind of like, look, you can play basketball or whatever, run track in, in school if you want, but you don't put extra time in. Like you, when you have extra time, it goes, it goes to football. Um, and that's just what it was from then on. I'm curious why you picked football, especially growing up being such a big Raptors fan. Like I know you used to try to watch all 82 games with your brother growing up. So what was it about football that made you pick it? Um, I actually don't know. I joke all the time with people that I chose the wrong one, clearly. Um, cause no, but seriously, it's, um, I think there's just something so like, you know, Coliseum being the, the gladiator in the battle, you know, in the Coliseum battlefield, like about football that, that stuck with me as a young kid. Um, for sure. You know, I liked, the, I liked the physicality of it. Um, I liked, you know, to outrun people and sort of winning in that way. Um, and that's just it. I mean, football's one of those ones where, you get to actually physically beat somebody. Um, whereas basketball, I mean, you can for sure, but it's not quite the same experience. Um, so football is always just a one for me. 
And there's another sport in there I wanted to talk to you, ask about that. I feel like I don't hear you talk very often, but were you a national champion in karate? Um, yes. Yes, I was. <laughs> uh, I think I was a two or three times national champion in continuous sparring. Um, and I think maybe once in point sparring. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're right. I don't think I've talked about that very, very often, if, if at all. It definitely was a huge, huge impact athletically. Like, you know, the flexibility, the strength, all that sort of stuff, you know. Your senpai and sensei would make you do two minute wall sits when you're like 10 years old and just, you know, develop muscles and all the push ups in the world. I remember I got to high school at like very literally 100 pounds, maybe 105 pounds, and was like able to do reps at like 135 and stuff. And I remember the junior football coaches were like, this kid doesn't have a linked single piece of muscle on his body. And yes, somehow he's lifting weights. And that's fully karate's um, doing because I would talk so much, I'd have to do a lot of push ups in class. So, you know. And so speaking of high school, this is a very random question, but I really want to know what the circumstance was where you got your armpit hair wax in like the school gym or something like that. Um, yeah. Wow. That's a funny one. Um, what a throwback. We did it every year, actually. I think it was called like wax for the cure or something. So the, all the male students would raise money to get waxed and they would bring in like a school, like an esthetician school into the gym for a lunch period. And like you'd raise money from your friends, family, and stuff like that to get waxed. And, like guys get their, their hair or their legs waxed usually. And I think somebody challenged me to get my armpits waxed. Um, yeah, that was a humbling experience. I had, like blood coming out. Oh yeah, it was it was ugly, but it was funny. It was pretty funny. That's a good that's a good gem right there. That's a that's a nugget. Thank you. I found I can I found it somewhere, and I was like, oh, I definitely have to ask that <laughs> on the podcast. Yeah. Um, and then, so it was also in high school where you switched from quarterback to receiver, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, it was. I think uh, grade grade eleven was my first year playing receiver, um, and I mean, I was kind of a running back before, kind of, and like sort of half in the high school way of like go play quarterback because if nobody else can play it, then you might as well play it. So you can run around, but I really did love quarterback. Like loved it, loved it, loved it. Um, but there just was didn't seem like there's gonna be a future. I wasn't really growing up as much as I would have wished I would. Um, and then they just stuck me out a receiver my first year um, in senior, and you know figured it out pretty quick. So that was Coach Johnny V that put you at receiver. Um, yes, yes, it was Johnny Buvalite is the the man, the myth, the legend, the one one of the one of his one of a kind. Um, yeah, he's the best dude on earth. And so then your junior, that was the year you moved out too, right? Like you were living on your own at 16? Um, yeah, yeah. So grade 11, towards the back half of it, uh, moved out moved on my own. Um, and yeah, I lived a couple blocks away from school. That was a, a journey. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, but so talk to me then, so you, you switched to receiver and then you were the number one ranked receiver coming out of high school, mm-hmm. uh, but you stayed up in Canada the entire time, right? I know your dad was pushing you, wanted you to go to Atlanta, I believe, live with your aunt. Mm-hmm. You all opted to stay in Canada. I'm curious why you did that. Yeah, it was a uh, good question. I mean, it was kind of a little bit of like a half-baked plan, I think. Like my 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 aunt and my uh, cousins, they live right in Conyers, Georgia, just outside of, just outside of Atlanta. Um my cousin had, you know, some scholarship offers, I think, to Georgia Tech and some other places before he he did a his knee in his senior year. Um and he kept saying, like, just come play like come play the high school I went to, like obviously coaching and stuff would get you in and we'd be fine. Um it was kind of one of those ones where it was like, I'm a social guy and the idea sort of in like grade nine or ten of just like uprooting and leaving was definitely a little intimidating. Um didn't necessarily know if it was going to be the solution to everything. Um, I think just because of that, we just didn't really jump on it, moving to Atlanta. And then similarly, like as we, as I started to go through the recruiting process, it was kind of like, okay, well, yeah, you're highly ranked, but like, you know, especially back when I was in high school, it was like kind of had to go do the whole camp circuit and like really get your name out down there. So most of what we heard back was like, okay, go to uh, New Mexico, you know, prep schools and stuff like that and spend a year or two. We kind of were just like, at least me personally was like, Man, like I'm gonna work as hard as I can wherever I go. If it's here in Canada, it doesn't it's not really gonna be a whole lot different than if it's down in the States, with these fellows telling myself. So um yeah, kind of just everything as I mentioned, a little half baked, not quite there. And I think a little bit too of I, I wanted to stay a little bit closer to people that I knew and loved. Of course. And so I ended up staying in in Canada. I'm um, going through the whole recruitment process there. And there's one thing I a video clip you saw, I believe it was in high school that I wanted to ask, but it was Tim Tebow, where he said, When you look in the mirror, you're the hardest working person in the country, your position. And that had a pretty big impact on you, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot to say about Tim Tebow and his uh corniness. 
and or or whatever you want to call it. I he is a little corny, I think, but there was definitely one that I that always 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 stuck. Um, and because it, it was just a simple thing in the world, like before you go to bed at night, do you look at yourself and say, like, did anybody outwork me in this country? Like, did any receiver? Did you know? I'll, was it Jamal K? Was it Shaq Johnson? I remember all the guys that were supposed to be better than me in high school. Uh, was it was it all you know all these different guys? Did they outwork you today? And if they did, then why are you going to sleep? Um, and that was just pretty much what we did every day. Well, that's like I saw. I think I don't know if it was in college or if it was a camp in high school, but it was like Tebow where they had to do curls or something with a certain with a set amount of weight. And like some guy did, like Tebow wanted to make sure he set the highest. Man, he had like a hundred and something, and the next guy was like thirty five or something like that. Like that guy was a bit of a, a freak yeah. when it came to training. Yeah, absolutely um, he was. But you mentioned like you said you remember the names of those guys that were supposed to be better than you in high school. And it's like from my understanding, you would almost like fuel that, like let the fact that these guys are supposed to be quote unquote better than you to like drive you in your training, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, it was, I'd usually yell at, like, sometimes I'd yell at before I tried to wonder at Max, just, you know, set of squats or some crazy stuff like that. Like, yeah, whatever you, whatever I could do to, to give myself a little extra juice and fire on the, you know, some extra logs in the flame, we'd do it. Is that a healthy way to motivate yourself? Um, I don't know. I mean, like, a therapist would probably say no. But I think in the, in the world of athletics, it's probably pretty standard, to be honest. Um, so, you know. No harm at least I didn't, you know, attribute to my self worth. It was just like a, hey, are you working hard enough? I think it's it's just a barometer for how hard you're working. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, but I mean, hey, it paid off, right? Like I said, number one recruit in the country. Ultimately, like, you're looking at Guelph. Thought you were going to Western. Forgot you had a meeting with Carlton. Took the meeting. Things went really well. I know they had. Um, I mean, one, you were excited to build something from the ground up. Two, they had a receivers coach specifically. I believe the other two schools didn't have that. And that also kind of attracted you there. And obviously the thing that everyone asks you about is the Hail Mary in the Panda game with the big Ottawa versus Carlton rivalry. But what I want to ask you about specifically with the Panda game is, did it have extra meaning to you because you caught that pass on your dad's birthday? Um, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it definitely was pretty cool. You know, we, um, I remember that day obviously really well. Like I woke up at 5 a.m. and couldn't sleep. Um, and my dad, he's a music producer and, you know, he's a night owl. So he was still up. I remember I called him because I was just like, throwing up a, wow, that was be corny. I was going to say throwing up a Hail Mary. Cause I was, <laughs> I was walking around, um, like Bank Street, Dick Leave, Ottawa uh, area, just like literally looking for breakfast, walked to like the subway. It was like a 45 minute walk and just calling people, seeing he was awake and he was up and just like, you know, just little dad like quips that day, just like, Hey, you know, just take it play by play and yada, yada, yada. Then after the game, I like finally get in the locker room and get in the call and then he was like, Boogie, you know, like that's the best birthday present like I could ever ask for. And I was like, Oh my god, I'm a bad son. Like I literally I called you like freaking out because I couldn't sleep and like forgot it was your birthday. And now like you reminded me and I was like, Well, oh, yeah, so it was pretty damn cool. Um and really, really, really fun all around. Yeah. Do you get sick or bored of talking about the panda game seven years later? Honestly, okay, so it's not that bad because it I mean, for anybody that doesn't know, it it just passed a few weeks ago. So um it's not bad because I usually get to go at least like 340 days without talking about it. And then, and then it's like right around, you know, there's usually one or two, you know, whether it's Carlton or a couple of new series, I want to just like get a little, a little one liner, a quote. So it's not that bad. That's fair. And I'm curious, like how much of an impact did that have on your draft stock? Like did that just like, obviously your name was, you came in as a highly title recruit from high school, having a good college campaign, college career, but did just kind of that catch it just being everywhere all over the media, media everywhere is picking that up. So like, did that help you? Do you think boost your draft stock? I'll just getting your name out there even more. Yeah, I think without a doubt it did. Um, especially that was kind of like our first sort of statement win. Like we, we went 0 8 first year naturally because we were all children. Um, and then that, that was our sort of our first year, or sorry, our first win against a, a respected program at the time, Waterloo. Uh, no disrespect to them, but they weren't necessarily top. Um, they're doing great now. But that Waterloo was the first win. Sorry, first win, then we lost one, and then we beat out of you sort of to, to wake everybody up, let them know. And, you know, outside the Hill Mary, it was, a, it was a pretty big game. I, I, you know, I set the Carlton record that, that game for receiving yards, I think, or catches one of the two. Um, and I think, yeah, like you said, it just kind of was like, oh, there might be a football player over there at Carlton. Um, and then, yeah, I just got to kept trying to build that success. And you mentioned how you went 0-8 that first year. And like, and you knew that going into it though. Mm-hmm. Like it was a brand new program. Like I mentioned how you wanted to go there because you could build something, but there's going to be growing pains when you build something. And so 
how do you kind of keep going? Like, obviously it's a season you have to keep going, but like, why do you want to decide to go there when you know it's going to be a potentially an, a winless season and what keeps you going through, through an O and a year? Absolutely. Um, we just, one, I think we were too stupid to know any better um, in the best way. Like you're just too young, naive, full of arrogance and, and all that good stuff to know any better. And two, it was like, we, we knew that we had talent. Like you, we'd come in, you know, in the first couple of days of training camp, you see some of the guys running around, like you see Tunday, Nate Hamley, you see Leon Sunarini, Jesse, you know, all these guys that are just like freak athletes, but just 10 pounds too light on muscle, <laughs> not enough facial hair to be taken seriously yet. And like, don't have any idea what the hell they're doing running around the field just yet. So we all knew what was there. Um, and then the way that our coaches pushed us and like the reaction and response of all of us was just like, the guy next to you is just, doing it and the guy next to him is just doing it you don't have a choice you just keep doing it and all of a sudden we just see ourselves putting on weight and muscle and all this stuff and you're like can't wait to you know get to the next season and there it was and so ultimately fifth overall in the 20, 2017 cfl draft mm -hmm. what was your actually was the giants mini camp was that before or after the draft um it's technically before it's before the draft yes it is. before the draft it's before the draft yeah. And I've heard you say you you know exactly what play it was that got you cut. Is that true? Um, I it's not necessarily that I know exactly what play. Um, there's one really frustrating one for sure, and then you know the I think the the worst part was knowing that I was beating you know beating former first overall picks in one on one stuff like that. Uh, first round draft picks, just say not first overalls. Um, but I know like their assistant GM called me called me over before we all all left and was like look it was this close like just because of the makeup of the roster we had to keep an extra tailback going into camp so we're keeping this you like this undrafted free agent that's tailback but um like the next person on the board was you and that was like damn and not that that would have guaranteed anything you know that's a that's your chance in training camp and things like that but i know that you know getting this, in that environment and, and keep grinding and getting getting that chance would have been pretty something pretty special so I had to really show off some of the things I think make me a great player, which is you know, my brain and stuff like that. So, you know, it was it was tough, but it was a very great eye opener in terms of how small those margins are, you know, between the two leagues. And it was kind of kind of nice to, to see. Definitely like the margins between the two leagues and just like the margins to get to that level. You know what I mean? Like just how hard, like, I feel like people, like obviously there's people who watch on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, depending on the, the league and the team and the game. But like, but I could, I could have caught that. But like, you know what I mean? Like they, they don't really don't understand. Like, I don't think you've ever even caught a football that's moving that fast yeah. in general versus like running around. You know what I mean? Like there's just, just have the smallest little things that it takes to get to, to the top. And it really is breathtaking. Like it's like the difference between the guy who goes for a thousand yards and the guy who's on the PR who you're never going to hear about is so little. Like it could honestly, in some cases be, Oh, well, the OC no, knew his receiver and coach. So he just had this extra bit of trust. And then he put him in first and he got to go with Eli and the other guy had to go with the, the fourth, you know, quarterback and boom, boom. And all of a sudden now this person's, you know, taken off and it's an all pro. Like it's, there's no, oh, it's just unbelievable how small those margins are between the, the best talent. And yeah, like you said, people don't know. And also they just have no concept of like how insane the, the game is, how hard it is to do what some of these guys are able to do. Oh yeah. I just, I always remember like, it's when I, when I first started working with the Red Blacks and like just being able to watch the games from field level, it's a completely different experience than watching from the crowd. Mm -hmm. Like you just realize how fast things are moving, how hard guys are hitting. You know what I mean? Like, especially fast, like looking down on my phone to tweet something and looking up and seeing the play coming towards me and having to get out of the way super quickly. You know what I mean? Like just the speed of the, it's just insane. I just don't think people realize that. And so like with that in mind, what was your first like welcome to pro football moment? Like, did you take a big pop or like what happened where you were like, okay, this, this is pro football now. Um, my first snap actually, I think for sure. Um, I don't remember the guy's name, but it was my first, first rep, I was on kick, kick off return. Um, I think I was playing boundary tackle or something. So my job was like, I got to run back, see the returner set, go to my account. So you get a number, right? Like, okay, you're blocking number three to the boundary, number five to the boundary. I remember doing my count and there was a dude who was wearing 77 for BC Lions. He was like, he looked like The Rock, like legitimately. A little bit fair, more fair skinned, um, but he looked like The Rock. Like, I was like, this, this guy is either, he just ate a bottle of steroids or like, I don't know what the hell is going on. And I like counted like six times. I was like, please don't be fine. 
please don't be five. I was like, no, no, maybe he's four. Oh, that's five. Oh my God. And then dropping back and just like fucking at the windshield, like, eh, try, eh, like letting him hit me, but trying to like take it in a way that he would at least slow down a little bit and just trying to be a speed bump. Uh, I remember that one. And I was like, okay, yeah, this is, this is serious. And, and so like, and when you play too, I mean, so obviously like for a lot of people that don't know, especially as a Canadian player coming in, you got to play best teams first before. Um, and so obviously now you're number 80 wide receiver for the auto red blacks and you keep a score in your head of every route you route you win and lose in the game. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I kind of keep a running tally. I'm like, okay, uh, I'm going to run a seven route or I'm running a five route or whatever. You know, you're not always going to get the ball. Um, especially depending on the position you play, you know, um, you know, the, the quarterback's read, things like that. So you got to find a way to not grade yourself. Um, but also sort of stay motivated. You know, it can be very disheartening if your offense is struggling and you, you get one or two targets in a game. So um, one of the things I started doing is exactly just that is, you know, I'd, every time I'd run a route, I'd kind of go to the sideline, watch the iPad and make sure like, okay, I had the separation. I needed it. That's a win. Great. And then, or obviously the inverse. And then one of the things that keeps me a little bit more sane, because uh, you will, you can go, you can go start to the games without the targets and it's hard. And I would be remiss, especially because it's timely, not to ask you about getting the chance to play quarterback. Yep uh yeah so what what, what happened i didn't really i i saw you post a tiktok about it so did like did dom and the guy did the qbs you because you were the emergency qb so did, was everyone else hurt is that what ended up happening yeah exactly uh dom davis pulled his hamstring um matt had i, I don't know what the final diagnosis of some sort of stinger type thing there like he he tried to lower his shoulder for a for a first down and it went a little sideways so yeah it was Emergency quarterback time. Uh, the extent of my emergency quarterback training is very literally on day fours or walk through days. Like when the special teams are just figuring stuff out, I walk over um, to the sideline or to the sideline with the with the uh, centers and take some snaps and practice a cadence, and that's it. <laughs> so that's the extent of my quarterback to prep. Um, but it was time to go, and we just went for it. I love it. I love it. And the highest highest completion percentage in the league now, I believe. Something allegedly, that's what they say. Yeah. That's awesome. But no, so now bring me back a couple of, it's been over two, over two years now. I I don't, whenever COVID started, I can't even, I don't even know how long it's been at this point. But so I believe you had the idea for firework before that, but bring me into COVID kind of hits, world kind of stops. Obviously training becomes difficult for you because like you can go with the guys, like no one really knows what's happening. Is that when you finally be like, okay, now it's time to to work on this this idea this business idea i have or like what was kind of your once pandemic hit what was kind of going through your mind yeah actually so i i kind of started um chugging along slowly but surely um probably like january february so like a month or so before probably a month and a half or two and i mean and i say that very modestly like you know plugging away the biggest business plan downloading one off you know, lawdepot.ca and just like putting thoughts together, um, you know, emailing some people that I know and just chatting. But yeah, I mean, it was kind of just, I'm so used to like expending all this energy daily with like four hour workouts that like that was no longer there or an option. So it was like, I need to pour my energy into something else or I'm going to go insane. Um, and it allowed me to just sort of double down. And the team had started to come together, which was great. Um, you know, we started to, to bring some, some people together. Um, but yeah, having all that energy and time to just like, let's just do this. Cause what else am I going to do? I actually went back to, to London as well. My mom, um, my mom was pretty stressed to start sort of start of it as a lot of people were. And I was like, well, I'm just sitting on my, on my hands here in my condo. Like I'll just, I'll come home for a bit. That bit turned into like three and a half months or something like that. But <laughs> sitting at your, sitting at your mom's house, um, you got to do something. And that's what we started working on as firework. Okay. And as a, for anyone that for the uninitiated, what is firework? Um, so Firework is a matchmaking platform that helps brands and athletes come together and form um, you know, their dream partnerships, as you mentioned, execute marketing campaigns specifically around social media or, you know, not specifically, but mainly around social media, I should say. We're working on some things off social media, but, you know, it's been a blast. Um, you know, there's just such an awesome opportunity here right now and, you know, we're excited to take advantage of it. And I found, and this might be from your website, it says from hometown heroes to international icons. And talk to me about that spectrum of athlete. It's not just the top of the top. It's everyone, like even like Olympians to, so I kind of just talking about that spectrum of athlete that you're working with. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, you, you uh, hit it right in the head there with, with the word Olympians. Um, we think national team members 
um, Olympians, Paralympians are, are probably the, the area that can use us the most, especially at the start here. They're so severely underfunded and such incredible athletes with so much marketing potential. Um, and it's just, they're just underutilized. I mean, we think of NBA players, of course, um, soccer players, I think probably one, one, a one B there. Um, then you move into sports like football and which is a little harder because people wear helmets. Um, but Olympians are so incredible because they are very literally pouring themselves into their, into their sport without a contract to guarantee anything. But they have the recognition because everybody who knows them knows who they are, knows how hard they work. And there's, there's sort of this, um, real affinity between them and their followers and their, and their fans. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, especially here in Canada, they just don't get, make enough money. And there's so many brands that can use them to help themselves grow as well. So sort of our, our dream is that, um, you know, helping athletes from their sport into their career, especially those that, you know, their contract doesn't do enough. So we do work with them. We also have, you know, very large names on the, on the platform as well. I'm not going to, I won't go too, too far into it, but you know, NBA all-star Super Bowl champions and the like, um, all the way sort of down. So there's just, there's opportunities for everybody. And that's what we mean by dream partnerships, right? It's like Nike's dream partnership is a whole lot different than, you know, the mom and pop shop selling pizza in Ottawa, Ontario, but there's a dream partner for them in an athlete somewhere. Um, no matter who you are. So talk to me then about what you had to do to get a brand deal before Firework existed. Like as a pro athlete, what did that look like? Was it just hoping someone came into your inbox? Was it trying to reach out to brands? Like what did that look like for you specifically when trying to get brand deals? Yeah, I mean, messy, I think is the simplest way to put it. It's uh, uh, the Instagram DM, um, you know, saga. So it's sending off, sending off a DM, getting an automated response back or sending off a DM and going down a rabbit hole of messages back and forth, turning into email, and then they they forget about you and, and there goes two months of lead time. It's just this mess, um, especially for, you know, CFL, uh, uh, less marketable leagues than, you know, the NHL or NBA here in Canada by, by every metric. Um, you know, the agents don't really make their money from marketing deals, if, if at all. So they're, they're not really pursuing them for you. So it really does become sort of this, you know, solo mission into a space that you have no idea how to navigate. And oftentimes, I think the problem as well for like the mid to low tier athletes is that the brands working with them also don't really have an, don't know how to navigate it as well because they don't really, they've never really worked with, you know, quote unquote, um, you know, pro athletes, influencers, celebrity, whatever you want to call it. So it's kind of just everybody's guessing. And some people are like, hey, here's a tub of protein for 10 posts. And some people say yes. And another person's like, I know my worth. Can I have a thousand dollars? And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you trying to do? Rob me? So there's just this craziness and that's what we want to solve. So how is Firework solving that? How's it bridging the gap between these athletes and these brands? Yeah, absolutely. We're essentially, um, I actually fought this um, comparison for months, if not years, but I've finally given in. Uh, much like the Bumbles and Tinders of the world, everybody who's there knows what they're there for, right? You're there to meet people at the right time. And that's, I think that's the first thing is that you're not jumping into the DMs of a random brand when it's not time for them because you could be the perfect fit for them. But if they're, they've are they already allocated their budget for the quarter, et cetera, then there's no point. So these brands are able to put their campaigns forward, essentially like a job posting, let athletes know, hey, now's the time. Here's what we're looking for. If it's the fit, let us know why you're great for it. And that saves a lot of that for the athletes. And then, of course, we help the athletes with education around their own how to price themselves, things like that. And the brands as well get all this information and data behind them. So, you know, they're following count, all these different things. So they know the real value there as well. So the whole thing is that we don't want to be transactional. It's not just this click, pay to play, you know, post something and a thousand people are going to go out there talking. But we want you to build a relationship, go back and forth, have transparency at the core of it, and then create something that's going to be long lasting and have real impact. Is there anything like maybe not right now, but like in the future to kind of help guys and girls with their personal branding as well? Because like there's nothing more disingenuous than when like I jump on an athlete's Instagram and it's just like brand deal, brand deal, brand deal, brand deal, brand deal, brand deal, brand deal. Oh, a game photo, brand deal. Brand deal. <laughs> Is there eventually down the line like going to be something to help educate players? Yeah, absolutely. So we're actually uh, speaking. I'm not sure when this one will be airing, but we're speaking um, and announcing our, our formal partnership. It's very exciting. I won't give too too much away with a big um, governing body for a lot of athletes here in Canada. And that's core of what we're doing. So we're working with some awesome people in the space to, to deliver um, education on to, to our athletes, especially on branding, um, on how to price yourself, um, on how to navigate just this, this messy world on your own. Um, because that is just it. It, it can be tough. And like you said, once you start going for anything, then you're going to end up getting nothing. And that's something we want all of our athletes to know. And that's, again, like why we really, really hammer down on these authentic, 
dream partnership. It's not come here and get any deal because those aren't, that's not how you get long-term success. It's find the ones that make sense that fit in organically um, into who you are and what you do. Definitely. And it's also on the brand side as well. It's not just, I should just say, it's not just on the athlete to post. It's also on the brand to vet who they're working with and make sure it's that dream partnership that you talk about. And you mentioned how with that, the partnership you're going to be with the governing body here in Canada. I'm curious, especially someone who's played in the CFL where there's a good mix of guys from the States and from Canada. How is the mindset different around brand deals from guys coming up from down South versus guys up here North of the border? If there is a difference. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know that I'd say there's a, a super market difference that I can, you know, highlight on a highlight on the whiteboard or anything like that. Um, I do think it's much the, or sorry, I, what I will say that I, I tend to notice um, that Americans are, are much more comfortable being aggressive with brand deals. And I think that might just be the American mindset, regardless of like, take, take, take what you, what you want, because no, no one's going to give it to you. And I think Canadians as well, we're a little bit more like reserved and like, do we want to, you know, do I, do I want to get, get let down or get shut down? Or maybe I'm not going to, am I really okay to ask for money right now? There's all these kind of these little things I think that Canadians uh, sort of have, but we want to help them to wash that away. Definitely. And so like, and again, it's all going to come back to just using the platform and getting comfortable with it. Just getting almost like same way you're getting reps in the gym. It's going to be getting reps, just reaching out and asking to brands and stuff like that. And so you said too, how like before the pandemic really hit, you already kind of started to assemble the team. So I'm curious like what that process looked like for you to, to put a team together around this, this company. This is one of my, one of my more favorite stories. One of my more favorite, my grammar is all, it's Monday, by the way, anybody listening to this, so don't blame me. Um, yeah, I had the idea, met with a pretty senior guy at Shopify, actually. Um, luckily, I think I, no, I think I had LinkedIn or something, just wanted to run the idea back. I was like, it was uh, somebody, somebody who's been there for over a decade and just wanted to, you know, just pick his brain, ask him, where the heck do you even start? You know, I have it's like a thought, but like, I knew enough to know that I was never going to write the code. That's for darn sure. So I just sort of started to, you know, bounce it off him. He really liked it. He liked, really liked the idea sort of where he was at in his career and sort of what he was looking at in the future was kind of, um, you know, like he wanted to start to advise and you know, sit on board and things like that. So it was kind of a perfect pairing there. And he was like, just run with it. So a guy I played with um, in, in university actually worked at Shopify, AJ Thompson. He was in charge of, not in charge of, but he was, he worked with um, with their interns. So, you know, all the University of Waterloo, McGill, Concordia, you know, everybody's in there, in the intern in an internship at Shopify. And I was like, hey, can you like send something on your Slack channel? He's like serious? I was like, yeah. Did you like send out? He's like, sure, man. And I was like, tell them that I'm Tyron Lou with the clipboard, and I need LeBron James to go out and execute because I know that my play means nothing unless this thing is built right and done right. And he's like, do you actually want me to say that? I was like, if you can say that exactly, yes. And so he did, and you know, five or six people kind of bit the cheese, and and we we met, and a few of them it made sense for, but yeah, they were just a little busy, and then two of them, Yan and Adam, are still with me today, and you know, we've just been just been chipping away ever since. And so did you bring them on as co-founders when, when they came on or like, how did, how did that look like? Yeah. So it's, um, we kind of our founding team. So it's kind of myself as the business side of it. And then instead of just like one to one, see, you know, tech co-founder, business co-founder kind of brought together like a, you know, Thanos' glove of tech side co-founders with like a UI UX designer, one front end mobile, one front end web, one back end, et cetera. So, um, this founding team is still pretty much intact and pretty awesome. It's awesome. And so when they come on board, like, are you, are you paying them in the beginning or is it just like, because it's the founding team, like obviously there's no funds yet once we haven't fundraised or anything. Like how do you convince someone to join that? You know what I mean? When it's just like, just past, like you're past the stage of back of the napkin, but like, it's still very early. It's like, what is like, you have your, your LeBron Tyron, Tyron Lou pitch, but like, how are you, once you're actually meeting these people, how are you convincing them to come on board? Well, I think uh, it was kind of a perfect storm. I remember when I met with Adam, um, we were talking, moving back and forth, and then he was like, he kind of stopped me in the middle of it. He's a funny kid. And he's like, can I just show you something? And like flips his phone screen on the Zoom and like flipping through his notes. And he's like, this right here. And like circles it. And he's like, I was talking with my friend like two months ago on this subject. And I looked down and it literally says influencer marketing platform question mark. And so he was like, they were already, you know, they had already had the thoughts around it and stuff. So for them, it was just kind of, I think convincing them that I was, you know, that it was worth trusting me with their time, you know, that I was going to work harder than that. I was going to work hard enough to make them to life. And, you know, one of the things I think it's the exact same in sports is like, if you're going to be a leader or a captain or whatever, you know, like you have to just work harder than everybody. So there's never a doubt that you're not going to put it in because it becomes pretty easy to give your time to, to somebody or something. If you know the, 
sort of the head of the snake or the captain of the ship is going to be working, you know, as hard as humanly possible to make this thing work. And I think that's what kind of sold it in. And so from your side where it's like, you're going to be working just as hard, if not harder than everybody else as a non-technical founder, what is working hard look like for you, especially early on, right? Where you wanted these guys to know, Hey, I'm putting the work in, but like you're not building the product. So what does working hard look like for you in that? And especially in that time period. Oh yeah. At that point, it's learning every single thing you can about the industry. Um, I think it's probably in no particular order, like learning every single thing I can about this industry. Um, from how you know they did it in the 20s to how they do it now and everything else in between and where agents sit and where managers and all these different things um building the most robust competitor analysis humanly possible like understanding everything i used to know like where the founders of our competitors like went to high school and like what they you know like i wanted to know every single thing about them just like i would like a, a dd i was playing in um everything short of like having voodoo dolls sticking them with pins like i was trying to trying to get there um and then also just like learning how to set up a company for success um you know and that's one that i'm still learning but you know legally um you know in terms of the actual structure and things like that and how to handle it possibly um and then of course because we are a bit of b2b um like starting to figure out how to sell and pitch this into the brand how to get build that side because with any marketplace, as we know, it's chicken or the egg, um, or chicken or egg, depending on your prescription to that myth. Um, was obviously going to be athletes. Like there's, there's obviously going to be at least a couple hundred I could get to in the text or so. But it was like, okay, how are we going to really get a corporate world built? So it's kind of those four, and I mean, that's obviously enough to spend spend some months on. <laughs> No, that's fair. And so talk to me on how you approached that, that chicken and the egg problem. That was actually one of the things I wrote down here is it's because like athletes aren't going to want to come on if there's no brands giving brand deals, but brands aren't going to want to come on if there's not athletes that they can pitch to. So it's like, how do you, how do you tackle that? Like you said, you can send the text. Is it just hoping that once you send that text, is that everyone in that also texts people and then it just kind of grows that way? Or like, what was the approach? Yeah, the approach was just, um, like just shoot first, ask questions last kind of thing of just like, I'm going to just start going to brands and just let them know this is what we're doing. Um, and I was just, I was very, very, you know, one of our um, advisors for Invest Ottawa, he was very, very great to have early on. Like he was, you know, he kind of taught me that you can kind of, it's probably not what they teach you in like, you know, how to win friends and influence people or whatever, but like kind of pitching and selling with some vulnerability, I think was incredible for us. Like I was just, the cadences I would get, I got to that was actually ended up being the most successful on link, like with LinkedIn and stuff was like, Hey, I'm a pro athlete building this because I know brands like to work with athletes. Like we're in the middle of building this thing. Like we were getting close, but like we'd love to just know what would work for you and if this would ever be interesting. And just sort of that vulnerability of like, Hey, I'm not perfect. Like I'm not just selling you my, you know, my snake oil. It's kind of like, I want to do this. And like, if you can help, you can use it. And that ended up working really well. And just to kind of like what that meant to the chicken and the egg was just kind of like, I didn't really have to choose. It was just sort of like, hey, this is what we're doing. And then, you know, if I ever came up organically with athletes, it was like, hey, this is what we're doing. It's going to be free. Like, you can download it and they can sit idle and I can just text you when there's something that's worth knowing about. Like, just download it. What's, what's the worst that's going to happen? So um, it ended up being, you know, not the end of the world, but we're still we're still young and just built with it. So what are some of those other early hurdles you had to overcome when getting when getting things off the floor, off the ground? I think the biggest one for like me personally was understanding how complex it is to build tech um ramifications of the tiniest things you know i'd go i'd go a few weeks um not really no that's not true i would see it every day but there you know i'd spend some time with brands and kind of hear from a couple of them like oh this feature would probably be really beneficial and then i would just sort of bring it to the tech team and just sort of drop it into a roadmap without really like at all understanding what that's going to do to our timeline you know well Hey, that's back end implications. And now the X needs to go before Y. And we now have to do all the, you know, we have to build these new yada yada. And that was really, really um, tough for me. And I really, really wish I had a better grasp of that because we'd be in a different, totally different place timeline wise. I would probably would have went right to web app. Um, a couple of the decisions in there that, you know, that I, that I regret for sure. Um, and then also just like the frustrations around investors. It's just the, the worst it's just, if you're an investor listening to this i love you and i hope that you send me money um just kidding but it really is the worst you know just like the the exhaustion of you know taking yourself out of your business to go and convince people of what you know to be true and they just look at you like you're an idiot because why would you be right and you know and you're just like uh like it's i spent a year or a year and a half 
getting to this point that I know this is why it's going to work. And then 30 minutes and some change, you're like, no, no, it's not. And you're just like, okay, well, all right, you're the king. Please keep me moving. And uh, that part's been tough for sure. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Maybe not necessarily about how frustrating investors are, but like your approach to to investing. Because it's obviously like there's investors all over the place, but like, how are you finding them? Is it through connections? Are you doing, again, like kind of like the LinkedIn thing? What's been your approach been to to finding and getting in front of these investors? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we started with a, a small, modest little friends and family round, um, I think as anybody should. Um, well, and of course, we self-funded with a decent amount on our, on our own. Um, that was just to bring in a little bit of development support, things like that. That was great. Got us sort of through to, that actually got us to beta, which was awesome. So we got to test everything and see all the horrible code we wrote and then fix it, which is, you know, the point of the beta. Um, and then since then, it's been a lot of, been a lot of connections. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we did the pre accelerator with Beth Ottawa, um, which was super great and, you know, great network here in, in, uh, in Northern East Ontario, I should say. Um, you know, through Angel Net, Capital Angel Network and things like that. And then it's just been sort of smiling. I mean, you meet so many different people and especially when you're in you know, sports marketing or, you know, sports tech landscape, it's a pretty small community. And with that, you know, you've talked to one person who's going to introduce you to the other. And now you're pretty much two degrees of separation from every single person you need to know in the space. So a lot of meetings have come through sort of that, that those vessels. And, you know, it's been great. It's just, you know, like a, the, the deal cycles and deal lifetime, you know, lifespan of, of uh, them is unlike anything else. You know, some people are like, boom, let's go. Like, well, let me let me see what the safe note looks like and let's move on to ASAP. And other people are like, amazing. Yeah, this could work great in our fund in eight months. And you're like, whoa, what is that? I, I would love something now if you any change sitting around for like a McDouble or something. No, but it's, uh, it's just, we're just learning as we go and we haven't gone into a full institutional round yet. We've done everything on, on notes so far, um, which is you know, sim- simplified the process quite a lot. We've begun building our connections in the in- institutional realm, but kind of with the understanding, like we don't really expect you to come in at this seed round, but we want to get this in front of you. So that when we come to you in series A, we're like, remember that little in, 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 you know, infantile company, look at us now we got, we got chest hair. So, um, but you know, we're getting there like that. And like, so then, What's your approach? Because I'm curious as a solo founder, technically, like that's got to be tough. Like, because obviously my experience seeing kind of the inside of true fans, like swishing on, like they do a lot of the funders and the other, they can like bounce things off each other. They can lean on each other. So how's that for you been kind of doing it running point by yourself, especially when it comes to to the investing side of things? Yeah. Um, I talk to myself more than I ever thought I would. That's for sure. I like, and I, you don't sleep very well because like you said, like I, I spend a lot of time like just thinking about through like a million different scenarios in my brain while I'm trying to sleep. The like four or five p.m. double espresso shots don't help with that, but I'm learning. I'm weaning. I'm weaning myself off. Um, but no, I mean, I think there's sort of two things here. Um, but Josh, who's you know sort of had a product on things um, and came in, he's actually one of the later founding team members, but he's just a business mind. He's an Ivy kid. I'll never let me forget it. Uh, meaning Ivy Business School for anybody, which is then arrogant Western kids who think they're better than everybody. Just kidding, Josh. Um, I'm not really kidding, though. No. Screw the Ivy kids. So he's he's got a great business mind, um, and he really sort of does take that role of like my sounding board. And then also our, our advisory board is incredible. Um, you know, from from Randy Osei, who I'm, I'm sure you know just through True Fan, and he's with Athlete Tech Group to you know some big players in the space in the U.S. and, and here in Canada and sports marketing and, and um, agency side of things. It's been you know, they, they, they answer my calls and they have to, because I call them a lot and I'm freaking out. So it's been, it's been a blessing. And without that, I, there'd be nothing left of me. I'd be the shell of a man. Shout out to Randy Osei. He's a, he's a podcast alum. Oh, I he? think he was episode 80, 82 or 88 or something like that. Yeah. I had him on a while ago, about probably half the episodes ago. It's like 80 episodes ago. Oh, but wow. He's very, very good dude. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious with that, with obviously like you're getting in front of a lot of investors and investors, as you said, are very opinionated. Ever They all have their own opinions. You also have this advisory board. You have Josh who you're bouncing ideas off of. How do you deal with, um, Mikhail Cho, co-founder of Unsplash, Tommy, it's called a uh, mentor whiplash mm. where it's like one person's telling you, this is what you have to do. And someone's like, this is someone else telling you, this is what you have to do. And they're the polar opposite advice of each other. And you're kind of like going back and forth between these two advice. Like how do you deal with, with mentor whiplash? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can use a perfect example actually. Um, so I'm, I'm embarrassed even to say it out loud. Our first name was autonomy before we became firework. I'm sure, I'm sure you knew that, Jacob, but I think you were just trying to help us out. 
with our with our branding um whatever it's called i don't know craziness um and the reason for the name autonomy was because i was at the very start like stealing a line from kanye all my agents know i hate agents being like, this is, this could be something to help athletes leave their agents. And ah, it's going to be amazing. And then one of our advisors, Lauren Spazwa, um, the, a veteran in the space, especially in the Olympic space with representation, but he also does marketing deals for brands. Like he's just jack of all trades. Um, we had a call because I was talking to one of his athletes. And he was like, hey, this is something pretty cool. Like, you might even get on a call with me and Brian and some, and some other guys. And I was like, Brian, too. I talked to Brandy about it, actually. He's like, oh, he means Brian Levine. Andre de Grasch, Christine Sinclair, Alicia Newman's agent. Like one of the biggest agents in Canada. I'm like sweating. Like, hey, how do I tell these guys that I want nothing to do with them and that I want them to jump in a tree and leave me alone and leave my dad? Get into a, get into a good call with Lawrence about two, literally two hours later. Um, you know, I kind of realized like, okay, there's, he made some great points. There's a lot of space here for Asians, um, especially when you think about like, you know, Asians here in Canada that are working in the Olympic space because they're not the greedy guys who are waiting for your $200 million contract to just take a piece of it and buy a second yacht. Like these are people who are grinding for athletes that don't, that need, you know, marketing to support their dreams and things like that. So there's just one example. Like we were very literally so the opposite. And then hearing that and we brought it back to the team, sort of weighed, weighed the pros and cons. We, I think we swatted it, which is hilarious. I'm a Silicon Valley fan. So like whenever these Silicon Valley references, I actually had to do them for the first time. I was like, doing it guys this is tech um so we swatted it and we realized like this whiplash was was right it sounded it's you know it's, it's not founded in nothing um and we ran with it and, and here we are but you know it happens all the time um and it is tough and so then with change like how hard was it to to change all the marketing materials that were out there already like you had the autonomy name out there you had the instagram like was it how much of a pain was it to flip everything over to firework yeah i mean changing everything over at that point wasn't you know when we did the official name change, we worked with an awesome company here in Ottawa, actually got to communications. They're rock stars. Um, Jacob, you'd probably, you'd probably know like Blue Panda Realty being an Ottawa guy and they're awesome branding. So they work with them. They also did Dive in Canada. That's why we, we found them because one of our advisors works for Dive in Canada, et cetera. Um, it was a lot. I mean, it's a massive process. Doing an official rebrand, like it's just, holy heck, like I'm talking multiple eight hour sessions where you get into like, it's almost like, you know, I thought they were going to send me paella to my house or not, sorry, not paella, peyote or whatever the heck it's called, where I was going to go on a vision quest. Like it was like that. We're getting into the weeds of like, you know, what we wanted everything to be. I think I just called it paella. There's a clip for you. Yeah. So you're going to send me a Spanish rice dish to my house. No. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, it was whatever. I mean, it was, we needed to do it. Like we had multiple marketing consultants and people who like came in, even people just who were friends. Like I could always tell there's an elephant in the room and our designer was the same with me, but he didn't want to step or my toes and everyone would kind of like for the end of like talking about stuff would be like so your logo like are you like are you, are you committed to it and by like the third or fourth person who was like your logo is a problem and by like the 30th brand who when i got on the call, call was like so anatomy marketing or atnmy or atnomy i was like okay there's we got a problem we got a problem i need to put my ego aside i made the name i made the logo they're both dead I'm accepting it. And then we moved on and thank God we did. And so what does firework mean? Yeah. It's a, it's a journey of a name. It's a double or triple entendre in a lot of words, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, so our, our big idea is to inspire growth. Um, our mission is to create dream partnerships. Sorry, our vision is to create dream partnerships. And our mission um, is to combine you know, technology and humanity to, to turn transactions into partnerships. Um, and what we realized is both sides of our marketplace we don't really love the word marketplace uh, but both sides of the world that we're living in um you know are passionate people you know whether you're you know we like to think about ourselves naturally as sort of a champion for smaller athletes smaller brands challenger brands like they call them um not the nike can't come use us please do um but you know we, we really do see that and you know with those challenger brands with those people who have you know, taken up a mantle with a small company or whatever you're so passionate for what you do right like you're like fighting scrapping day in day out and athletes, you're also obviously passionate for what you do. I mean, you're an athlete. Like I said, they're, it's a one-to-one -one there. Um, and with that, we're like, hey, well, they're passionate for the work that they do day in and day out, right? Like, it's like there's, there's, there's that. And there's also this idea of the spark. Like, when, they're, when a real partnership is made, like, there's a spark that happens in a connection. And there's, there's that moment. There's that, you know, that, that moment that it, that it happens and lights up. And so kind of bringing those two together of like his passion, which is naturally becomes, you know, a fire for the work that you do every single day. And the fact that this spark 
is what happens when a, when a dream partnership is made. We kind of realize like what's the greatest embodiment of a spark, if not a firework. And then also within that as well as the whole set sort of, and that's why S and W will capitalize this also that idea of the fire for the work that you do in everything you do because everyone that everyone involved in our ecosystem is passionate, is fiery um, for what they do day in and day out. So there is firework. And when you work with firework, you get firework. You get firework. There's the the third meaning that's a little more, eh, you know, you got to wink, wink, nudge, nudge on that one. But yeah. <laughs> I love that. And so then how do you, how do you price it? Cause I think in the beginning it was subscription, but now it's, it's a percentage of total budget of the campaign, right? It's like what led to that switch in the whole pricing model of the business? That was another in, in massive inflection point. I was, we were on me and me and my partner, me and Aaron were on our way. I was, we were getting ready for a date actually is what it was. I remember we were both, uh, we were both getting ready. I was getting changed. She was in her makeup and stuff. And I was just like, she kept talking and I wasn't there. She's like, are you like, hello, what's going on? And I was like, you need to give me 10 minutes. I called Josh, didn't answer. I called Randy, actually. I don't think he answered. I called Christina. She answered one of, one of our advisors. And I was like, I think I got it from, I think it really hit me. It was someone's book. Who was it? I'm forgetting his name, which is just horrible. It to be a founder. Stanford professor, one of the founders of, um, PayPal. Oh, this is going to be so bad. A zero to one, Peter Thiel. Thank you very much. Nobody, let's delete that whole, just kidding, don't actually delete it because I'm, <laughs> we're okay to be vulnerable here. I was reading Peter Thiel and I remember something, I, I don't actually remember exactly what part of it, what sparked it, but I was just like, look, why would we fight everybody to be another SaaS company, another B2B, you know, big bulky thing, you got to uh, put all your money up front for, get to the buying decisions. When we could just gather market share and just be the place where everybody can come and build these relationships. And, you know, I'd rather have 50 bucks from 10,000 people then fight tooth and nail to get 5,000 bucks from whatever the, the math is, even though that is, like, again, Monday brain. Um, but it was just like, it just seemed like a no brainer once it sort of hit me. I was just so hung up kind of early of like, hey, it's fast, it's B2B, we gotta just get, you know, have ARR, or have MRR, et cetera, which is insanely valuable, but we can get there later. Like we, as long as we can build users and prove our concept, there's always ways to monetize it with, you know, recurring stuff later. Um, check freaking zoom and we'll and laugh and as an example but yeah so i want to play devil's advocate on that for a quick second so we'll say 50 dollars from ten thousand people like you said which is how many people is that oh it's a division hold on i don't i have to calculate this because i don't know either so that's, we'll say that 50 from a hundred thousand people is is 500 grand why not focus in on a hundred brands paying $5,000. Like why did you decide to go that route? Cause it could be argued that getting a hundred brands is going to be easier than getting a hundred thousand brands or 10,000 brands, whatever that math is. So why do you, why is that still the model? Even though more people who could be make more work. So why is that the focus? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it comes down to sort of our target, um, our target market, especially on the athlete side of things, you know, it's, it's shifted a little bit with the, with us building an app for agents, especially because now with the agents, you get sort of the top tier talent. Um, but the way that the top tier talent executes their deals right now is cumbersome, hard to replicate in an app just yet. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We got some of the way. Um, but understanding that it's not likely that we're going to convince, um, you know, LeBron's agent or Steph Curry's agent to do the next shoe deal through an app on their phone. Like it's not likely. And we also know that the the big, as we've touched on, the biggest opportunity here is for those Olympic level athletes, you know, exactly that are that middle tier, right? Maybe they got 10,000 followers, maybe they got 50, but they don't make a million dollars a year in, in contracts. So with that, what brands align with them, right? Like who's the downhill skier from Halifax, Nova Scotia? Is Nike lining up to, to work with them? Maybe, for sure, maybe. There's definitely a chance, but I'm certain there's a, you know, challenger mid-tier, um, you know, alternative to Canada Goose who would love to find this, you know, similarly positioned athlete and that company might not have five thousand dollars to spend a year on a you know on a software, but they might unearth fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars for that athlete once they realize there's value there. And if we can get a piece of that and then and show the value and actually be able to prove the ROI or as close as you can to ROI on social media to that brand, then they're gonna spend more on the next athlete, the next athlete. And now we've got their business because we're getting a piece of this bigger pie rather than hamstringing them, making them real, making them pay up front and then going, ah, let's just test this or you know what I mean? Like we think that there's a better opportunity there and it aligns more with our, with our users. And as I said, like there's a experience to build for Nike to make it worth that five, 10, 15, 
million dollars you got to charge them to, to make it worth the time. But um, to start, we wanted to be here. And how do you make sure people stay on the platform? Because if you're creating these dream partnerships, it might be so good that they'll be like, well, let's just jump off Firework because they've done such a good job that people are willing to leave Firework now and just work together offline. How are you ensuring that doesn't happen? Because then you lose that piece of the pie, right? It's like, how, what's your, how are you tackling that problem? Mm-hmm. So the biggest um, value of our platform for a marketer worth their scratch um, is post campaign analytics and insights on, on how your content is actually, actually doing, right? As a marketer yourself, you know, if you, you get given a $10,000 budget um, and then you just say, hey, look at all these awesome posts we got done and you've got no, you know, you got nothing to point to about how that actually performed, that $10,000 budget is either shrinking quite a lot next time or your position is shrinking quite a lot as in you're back on, your, uh, back on the street. Um, so that's one of the main things is that leaving the, leaving the platform is going to completely you know, hamstring your ability to do that. And we also have proprietary analytics that, you know, just the athlete sending a screenshot is not even, does not even come close to in terms of, you know, what we, what we can report and, and deliver these brands. But also just the ease of everything being managed in one place, right? Like they, the content approvals in the platform, um, getting rid of the need for, you know, big email threads, et cetera, going back and forth, chat, everything, you know, um, scheduling and things of that nature as well. The idea of a turnkey solution is to be just that, is to be turnkey, that you don't want to have to leave it. And it's all, we've also priced um, everything sort of accordingly is the very nominal amount we take from athletes, the very nominal amount we upcharge, we upcharge on on the brand side of things has been, you know, we've stress tested it quite a lot with users on both sides to say, just to, just to see if people, you know, do you have that inkling of, ooh, that's just, that's a little too, like maybe it's, worth it to just deal with the headache to save that extra couple of bucks. But, you know, we feel pretty good about where we're at. We haven't seen that yet um, in our experience. That's good. And how are you then approaching marketing for, for your own, for your own app? Is it using your own app to, to work with athletes to, to market it that way? Or like, what's the approach been to marketing? I know you're doing some stuff with deep digital brands to build your own brand that to funnel people back to firework, but like, what's the approach been? Yeah, absolutely. So we're still, um, our marketing plan, we have a sort of our strategy built. Um, we're just, we're just finishing up a little bit of a, uh, I don't even know want to call it a bridge round because it's like, but I mean, a little seed to almost a little thing to, to just to get us in a place where we can throw a little bit more into that marketing bucket. We know what we're going to do. So we're actually working with, we'll be working with another Ottawa legend, um, Mr. Hayden Cash and himself on our digital, on our digital advertising spend and things of that nature. Uh, so we'll of course have a big digital footprint, um, targeting, um, you know, people who make those decisions at brands and with athletes, like you said, so we're doing a decent amount online. Uh, we're built up our, our, our socials organically. Um, and that's going to be a large part of it, right? Is it's like, it's, you know, the, the agent side of thing, bring on the biggest names, et cetera. That's always going to be a sales push. Like that's me reaching out to them. Like we have a, you know, I have a catalog of every single one in pretty much North America. That's, that's worth, worth knowing. And we're reaching out to them in, in an order that makes sense for us. Um, and then, you know, we'll be, once we're ready to turn, flip the switch, as Hayden says, and turn the turn the machine on, the digital ads will be, will be going crazy, and we've got a pretty good uh, um, sort of catalog of, of how we'll be approaching it. And it's just that, you know, it's just it's speaking to the why of things, kind of positioning ourselves as, you know, not that transactional marketplace because there's going to be people that want that. Great, go to Brandbaster or one of those like you know websites where you just click a whole button, you're and the faceless people start to talking about you. But for the people that want to build real long term, there's really going to be only one solution, um, and that's going to be Firework. I love that. I love and then, so how with the you said you're going to have a pretty big digital footprint for for the brand. What's the content going to look like? Because it's not just going to be promotional. Like go da- go download Firework. Go use Firework. Like, is it going to be educational type content? Like, what's the approach going to be for your own socials? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we sort of have uh, we have a few different pillars naturally. Um, when we talk, you know, Instagram, um, we're talking mainly speaking towards our athletes, um, you know, and that's going to be athlete education pieces, you know, how to price yourself, how to build your brand, as you mentioned. Um, we have some content that, that's coming out over the next few weeks around NIL, of course, um, talking with some NIL experts, having them explain things. We even have some some brands, um, you know, we have people who work at places like Adidas and stuff who are going to speak directly to the athletes just about what brands are looking for and things of that nature. Um, and then, you know, we get to the more professional and also easier to target places like Facebook and, and LinkedIn, which are going to just be you know, speaking to the value of athletes in marketing, obviously to the, to the brand, things of that nature. Cause that's just something that, you know, I think some people, no, I think we, I know some people don't quite understand like athletes are, you know, they've done about on average do about 2.5 times more engagement in sponsored content posts than regular traditional influencers. And there's just something to be said about, um, you know, people who are, 
who are speaking on a product that they use to perform at the highest level. Like there's just such a natural affinity um, to their, with their audience that it just it just performs better, and it's just educating people in you know in marketing on that fact, and then just letting them know slowly over time that there's a solution that can that can bring it all together. But that is sort of the play, right? It's just they gotta understand because it is easier. It is easier, and it's probably cheaper to just work with random influencer in a bolo hat for sure, you know, and an, and an icon. It's definitely going to be cheaper. No one's going to lie to you about that. But is it going to be more effective or more cost effective, cost efficient or effective? I don't think so. I don't actually it's a stat to prove it. Just not. Running a startup, especially as a founder, is, is very time consuming. It's very challenging. I can't even imagine what running a startup as a founder is like while also being a professional athlete with a full professional athlete's schedule. How are you doing it all? Um, yeah. <laughs> is that enough of an answer? Yeah. Um, bringing back some of that 2013 Carlton in that I'm, I'm too naive and too stupid to not, not to. I think I just told myself I was going to do it. Um, and I'm also very stubborn and had many, 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 many people tell me I wouldn't be able to do it, which just, I mean, that just made it a no-brainer that I had to do it at that point. So I think that the main thing is just, you know, um, prioritizing. Um, and then I, one of the things I'm learning, especially at the back half of the season, is like aggressively resting. I don't sleep a lot. I'm not going to lie to you. I, I really value sleep, and it's just not really an option right now. But when it's like the one off day I've scheduled of the week that would be off, like aggressively rest. Like I'm not like, don't even consider because it's like, that's the hardest part. It's not even the physical exhaustion, which is obviously real with football. It's the mental exhaustion of switching back and forth. Like I'll leave the, I'll leave the facility at 145, have my first meeting at 215 or 230. And like that 20 minutes of just like recalibrating to be a business person again, jumping on a call with an investor is like, it's soul sucking. It really, really does take a lot. So it's, you know, it's been, it's been tough. There's no way around it, but it'll be good for, the, for a book one day. There you go. That's what I like to tell people. It's like, whenever you're in that tough situation, like, well, how does this chapter end? Does it end well with, and I just gave up? Or does it end well with like a cool story at the end? Um, so I like that you said that. But tell me more about aggressively resting and what that looks like. Because that is something I am not very good at. Yeah, I'm still learning how to be better. But it's just that like, just like, don't find something stupid and mindless. Like for me over the last month or so, it's been FIFA because the new FIFA came out. And like when it's time to not do anything, like you mother better not do anything. Like I like have to yell at myself. Like I'll be like, I'll get a call from somebody business related and I'll have to be like, like fight everything. Like, yeah, get away from me. Because if I don't, if I, if I go into it, <laughs> I got puppies that can open the door for anybody watching video. There's my beautiful Georgia. Um, if I, you know, go down the rabbit hole of letting that get, like get me back into the work mode, then, I haven't read, like, there's just nothing. It's going to be seven straight days of just absolute chaos. So I think it's partially that, you know, there's reading a book, obviously taking the pups for walks and stuff like that. If you got to find something to aggressively pour yourself into that doesn't actually take from you, you know, it's restorative in some way. One of my, my favorite Nate Bahar quotes, read a book, get a dog and you'll be much happier. Yes. That is a, that's just a fact though. I mean, honestly, I've had, you know, I think I was chirping somebody the other day who was trying to complain to me about, some love love life problems and i was like just sent a snap of georgia rolling around in the grass and was like just get a dog like just give yourself happiness man if you got a if you got a confusing love life whatever just get a beautiful puppy or adopt a dog and just hold it tight and you're gonna just feel the joy like just why not man you know why not but hey i dig it and so what's your mindfulness practice like then you know what I mean? Cause like, obviously there's, you, you have your, your aggressive resting days, but like, that means six other days, like you said, is chaos. There's a lot going on. It's like, how do you find those small moments throughout your day, whether it be at practice or when you're taking calls or between calls, like to just kind of center yourself and, and be mindful of everything that's going on. Yeah. Um, I need to get better in the mornings. That's one that's left me. Cause I think I, I the brain, as you would know, like you have that entrepreneurial brain that like, you're thinking about business as you're sleeping and then you're thinking about it when you wake up and you just love stuff. But um, one of the big things, I mean, my my beautiful girlfriend, Erin Harris, owns Full Speed Yoga here in Ottawa. Full Speed Yoga, Full Speed Yoga, Full Speed Yoga. Um, so one of them is obviously yoga. Um, that's a game day routine for sure as well, just to like better things. And then a lot of a lot of breath work. Um, 
I used to be a huge proponent of Wim Hof. It's, I'm frustrated with myself now talking about it that I've let it slip, my practice slip. But even just, you know, mindfulness minutes of like, you know, some good five by five by five breaths, you know, five seconds in, five second hold, five second exhale, just or four, seven, eight, depending on what you're trying to do, if you want to come down and regulate. Um, just those little things of, you know, those little things you can steal really do make an impact, you know, and just like, like five minutes in a dark room can just do wonders for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you're in between meetings, go lie down for five minutes and just, you deserve it. And you said how it's kind of slipped lately, that practice. How do you get back on track with it? Um, just like anything, you just got to go and do it. Um, so I'll be my own motivational speaker here. I actually remember um, one of my one of my good friends, I think Matea J shared it with me. I believe he shared it with me on Instagram. Um, it was one of the best quotes I've seen. It was just like, it was a, I think it was an actual article, but it was just a snippet from it. Just talking about how, um, you know, people wait for like the moment they feel good or like, you know, better to get productive or do the thing that they want to do, which like, obviously that's so natural. Like that makes a lot of sense that you would like wait until you're in the prime but it's usually like us not doing stuff and like all of the negative self-talk we do around like not being productive that like has us in that mood. And just like the simple act of just like doing the smallest bit towards what you want to get accomplished. It's like what releases that endorphins and you're like, wow, I feel productive. And you just start to talk to yourself and all of a sudden you're sitting upright and you're like, you're, ah, and there's just this moment. And it really is just like, just start doing the thing, you know, and not in like an aggressive Tony Robbins, like, yeah, be great, bit, but like do the thing because it's actually gonna like make you happy, really. Like, and whatever it is, I need to clean my room. Well, then put away a sock, a single sock, see how you feel, and you're just gonna start to go towards the thing. So, I need to just do the damn thing and do swim off, which I'm gonna do tonight. Jacob, that's the promise. All right, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll text you either tonight or tomorrow morning. I'm gonna confirm that you, that you got it done. Um, but but no, I like that. It's like that five minute rule when there's that task you don't want to do, just do it for five minutes. And if you want to keep going after that five, by all means, but if not, you're just committing to that five minutes and seeing how far that takes you. Because I understand what you're talking about where it's like when you're not being productive because you don't feel good, then you get down on yourself for not being productive so that you just kind of spiral out of control because, and it's just never ending. And you just hope that some, in some point it'll just feel better and it just doesn't happen. So, so I relate to that. And then kind of on that note though, you have your aggressive resting days, but like, is there anything you do those other six days to rest? Like you said, you've kind of fallen off of the the Wim Hof thing and like not necessarily mindful, but just like recovery, I guess is a better term. Like, is there, you do yoga, is there a stretching routine you do before you go to bed or anything like that? Um, I wouldn't say anything too, too, too concrete. Um, it depends on the day, right? Like, I mean, sometimes we'll have deadlines the next day. And I think that's kind of the chaos of it is that not having a sort of a strict office schedule makes it a little bit hard because sometimes I have to be in here till 10 30 or 11 PM. Um, but what I will say, you know, I, the moments are usually, you know, like we just finished Ted Lasso. Like watching an episode of Ted Lasso before you go to bed it might be the the best level of self care humanly possible. I don't know if you, have you watched it. I have not. You, have not. No. you you need to. This is a full fledged ad right now. It is the most <laughs> wholesome yet entertaining and fun. Like it's just it's somehow almost perfect. Um, so things like that, you know, like getting an episode in with Aaron and like you know we'll usually maybe have a little treat. It'll, it'll be like a bag of fuzzy peaches around. You, know, you have a couple of, you have a couple of those and you kind of put your feet up and like melt into the couch. And you're like, ah, oh, okay. You know, um, maybe not fuzzy peaches. Don't do those before bed. This is your, this is your health warning. But um, that's, that's really been it. You know, it's been such a chaotic few months. Um, before that, you know, it was, I was a Wim Hof before bed kind of guy. Um, and I'm going to get back to that as we discuss. I know we're almost at a time here, so I'm going to jump to my last couple questions. This is probably going to be the most important question I ask all day. Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings? Oh, my gosh. I'm actually... Can I get a, can I get a um, deeper explanation of what you want answered? I just know that you're a big fan of both of those things, so I was putting you on the spot yeah, and making you pick one. I know. That's why I'm trying to get more definition. I have spent more of my life loving Harry Potter than I have Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is objectively a more incredible story and piece of literature and filmmaking. Harry Potter has a deeper place in my heart because of how I grew up and where I grew up and my age. It's a very, very, very well put answer. Very political. I was going to say, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. that's my politics. <laughs> and so how often do you reflect on the whole journey? 
you know, going all the way back to being that six year old kid running around London with the the silver and black jersey on to to now, you know, playing pro football, having your own company. Like how long do you how often do you look back on everything? Um probably definitely not enough. Um I actually have wondered like where reminiscing lives and, and what benefit it, it brings and gives. Um and there's obviously room for gratefulness in everybody's life and that should be core to it. Um, but I think I struggle with attaching sort of gratefulness to like where, where I've come from or anything like that, because I've also, I was also raised to be, um, probably dangerously confident as, you know, borderline, borderline on the bad side. I think my mom and her brother would tell you firsthand, they did a number on me, making me too sure of myself. So I would, I say that to say that like, it's always like, I've always, I would expect to do well or good or whatever it is and like the thing so it's like i don't find myself very often like ah you know like wow i'm so happy that i'm here it's more always like okay like what's good you did the thing that you told yourself you would do and go with i think that's something i can work on i think a lot of people can work on is stopping more to reflect and, and be filled with gratitude because it's such a powerful emotion I know you've been teased, especially in the locker room, for corny motivational speeches. So I'm curious if there's one piece of advice or anything, if you want to give the audience a quick little 30-second corny motivational speech. Mm, yeah. What's my what's my current day like thing? I, sometimes I, I oscillate between different, uh, you know, life um, models. I think, like, the biggest thing I could, you know, I ever say is just, like, be be confident and just do the thing like if you just go ahead and just decide to do it um then the only thing that the only thing you're fighting against is time like i i say that i say that pretty often i guess that is probably my motto at the moment it's like once you've decided to accomplish a thing like the only thing is just how long it's going to take for that to get done so if you just decide with every fiber of your body to have a thing done then it's it's done what Aaron and I always talk about. Once you decided it's done, now we're just waiting for the clock to get there, the calendar day for it to finally be done. That comes with confidence and that comes with real belief that you can do it. And I hope everybody is given the ability to feel that way and, and, and go for the things they want. For my last question, I like to flip the script a little bit. So instead of me asking the question, it's you asking the question, but it's not to me. Pretend you have a crystal ball. You can ask this crystal ball any question. You'll get the 100% honest answer. What is one question you want to know the answer to? What's like, what's actually the healthiest diet? You know, like we always talk about like life, like biohacking and like, yo, this is the one that's going to improve your, like, just tell me, man, like, do I need to just eat pineapples or like, I'll do it. Like if the universe can tell me like, shit, and hopefully it's not some like crazy vegan stuff because I don't have the funds for that. So I'm hoping it's just like apples or something cheap, but that's probably the one I think. Yeah. I would also like to know the answer to that question. I, I I appreciate I appreciate you asking that, but um, but I want to thank you so much, man. Like I said, it's been a long time coming, so I'm glad I was able to finally find some time to get you on the podcast. More on me for just not having the chance to to connect. But like, as soon as we had a call on the business side, I was like, I have a moment here. I'm going to ask you while I've got while I'm in front of you. Um, but I'm so glad we we're able to make this happen, man. I want to give you the floor now. Where can the people find you? Where can they find Firework? Plug anything and everything you got right now. Absolutely. Um, so I'm on all socials at Nate Bahar 11, that's B-E-H-A-R 11, the number, um, and then the firework dot app. So it's www.thefirework.app to find out more about what we're doing. Um, if you are an investor, hit me up, Nate at the firework dot app. We can talk. <laughs> well, I'll make sure everything's linked in the show notes down below so people can find it. It'll all be down there. Uh, but I want to thank you once again for taking time to be on this podcast. And I want to thank everybody for listening, whether you've listened the entire way through or you only listen to bits and pieces. I really appreciate you taking time to check this out. Everyone do me a big favor. Go and follow Nate. Go and check out Firework. Like I said, everything will be linked in the show notes down below so you can find it. If you'd like to follow me, you can find me everywhere on social media at the Jacob Kelly. Feel free to come and say hello. My DMs are always open. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Thank you once again for listening, everybody. We'll talk soon.